welcome, welcome, welcome to Discourse for May 2021. I'm your host, David Robertson. I'll introduce you to our guests shortly, but let me just remind you what we're here for. Discourse is the Religious Studies Project's monthly discussion of religion in the news, or rather, should I say, how the news media is talking about religion this month. And I've got a star-studded, extra-large panel this month, and uh, uh, needing no introduction, I don't think, but just for the sake of transcriptions, um, maybe we could we could move around the circle, starting in Australia. Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Brianne Fallon, who is currently a co-editor of the Religious Studies Project, but we will talk more about that a little bit later. And uh, next to the US, who uh, Dave, why don't you go next? <laughs> I'm Dr. Dave McConaughey, and I am currently uh, one of the co-editors of the Religious Studies Project. And finally? I'm Andy Alexander, and I am currently the transcription editor and web editor for the RSP. Well... There's some veiled, uh, some veiled things going on there. Why don't we just come out and see it? What's what is? Uh, why have we got editors, past, present, and future, gathered here today? Bree. Well, I think it's important for everybody to know that I've decided to step down from my current post as co-editor of the Religious Studies Project. It's been an amazing couple of seasons um, heading up the ship together with Dave, um, but I've decided to focus on other things at the moment. However, I am going to be staying around with the RSP, so I won't be too far away at all, even though Australia is technically very far away. Um, but that's very exciting because that means that there's a hole to fill and that hole to be filled will be filled by by me, Andy Alexander. I'm very sad that Bree is stepping down, of course, but I'm excited to be stepping up into this role. It's been such a pleasure to work with Bree and Dave as our co-editors. They've done a lot of excellent work for the RSP in the past couple of years, and I'm looking forward to helping Dave continue and expand those projects. I'm also very happy that Brie will still be part of the RSP team because she does such great work. Um, a little about me, I'm currently working on my PhD at Emory University, and my work focuses on the ways in which discourses of pluralism and inclusivity, specifically with regard to Muslims in America post 9-11, implicitly work to marginalize and domesticate Muslims in the U.S., um, so yeah, I've been a longtime listener of the RSP, and I'm very happy to be joining the ranks of co-editors and following in Bree's footsteps. And they, they really have done a great job. And uh, if you think about how much of an ask it was to take over from something that was very much a passion project that was based around Chris and I and our network of people originally, um, to step into that was was quite a big ask. So I'm just glad that we got Brie for as long as we did because, uh, you know, she's in demand. Um, if you think about as well, the, we wanted to try a sort of international team and one thing we just never really considered was the demands that time zones put on people. So if you think at the moment, just to get the four of us in the virtual room at the same time, you know, it's first thing in the morning for some of them, last thing at night for others, in the middle of the day for me. I mean, I, I drew the, the long straw this time. But um, if you think about that, every time you record one of the little intros or outros or, you know, when you have meetings, when you're answering emails, it really is an additional toll. So it's understandable uh, when, you know, uh, uh, life demands a bit more time than, uh, than you're able to to give otherwise but the the great plus is that we get to bring Andy in now and her energy and her uh, ideas into the team keep this thing moving keep it changing and evolving so um, I couldn't be happier and it's very exciting to see as I said you know three <laughs> this is the, the third uh, iteration of editors the third um, uh, Andy's the first person replacing an editor who wasn't 
myself or Chris. So this that's a you know it's quite an important thing in itself. So yeah. Um, congratulations to Andy. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations, Andy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited. We were asking quite a lot of Brie this episode, maybe because uh, it might be the last one of these she does. Um, yeah, so next we need to turn to something slightly less positive, I think, um, which is the University of Sydney. Yeah, thank you very much for that, um, Dave. Look, if I'm perfectly honest, we're, we here in Australia, we are having a little bit of a crisis mode when it comes to studies of religion here in Australia. And I wish I could say it was just um, the studies of religion department at Sydney Uni that's at risk. But unfortunately, this is actually almost a bit of um, a bit of a national epidemic. I mean, religious studies at the University of Queensland saw a number of closures a number of years ago and Monash University canned religious studies last year. And now we're seeing the potential closure of religious studies at the University of Sydney as part of an a restructure and operation that is going to see six of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences school scaled back to five and the Department of Religious Studies and the Department of Performance Studies um, are likely, we hope, certainly not to be closed entirely. And we're seeing a number of other different disciplines being sort of absorbed into other schools, um, being downsized. And a university spokesperson acknowledged the possibility of the restructure and closing a number of departments and programs, and they named both studies in religion and theatre and performance studies amongst those considered as options for closure. It's important for us to talk about the fact that there has been no sort of actual plan that has actually been been released to staff, so everybody's just feeling like they are just walking on a knife's edge. And there is a campaign going around social media at the moment, um, Save UCID Arts, and it's part of this broader discussion of the crisis, which is the complete disrespect of, of the humanities. And it's not just something that's happening here in Australia, it's something that's happening happening globally. And we look at the world sometimes and we think, how is it going so wrong? And perhaps that's in the fact that we don't uh, champion studies such as, as as that of religion and particularly the secular study of religion. So I think it's really important that the religious studies community, the religious studies project community actually are aware of these impending, as we said, hopefully we can stop it, but without sort of these hard, without any hard facts of what's going on, it just feels like this great dark cloud looming over, looming over us at, at the moment. And as an alumni of the Sydney Uni Studies and Religion Department, I know the the amazing work that they do, the prestige that they have, and it's something that I really hope that we can stop. Absolutely. And um, as you say, it's not something that's only happening in Australia. I mean, I was involved in the campaign trying to stop major cuts in Chester here just recently and um, there are other places which haven't gone public yet but are in similar situations um, and yeah I absolutely echo everything that you've said um, and if there's anything that we can do uh, you know beyond what we're already doing then you must let us know. Yeah, we'll do. Definitely, we might, um, you know, circulate a few sort of petitions and things like that through the RSP because the more voices we have, the better. Yeah, and I just want to add here that we are, um, or we we have shared a, a fair bit of information on our Twitter page over at Project RS um, about some of the events that are going on and different social media pages that you can check out that have the information about the petitions, links to um, all of that. So definitely go take a look at some of what's there. And we will, of course, be sharing more of that as information becomes available. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if we if we can't do that with the RSP, then... <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Bree. Uh, let's leave this sort of housekeeping stuff for now and jump over into our news stories and our first one's coming from Dave um, and it concerns 
mass cremations in India. Yeah, I have been troubled, as a lot of people have, by the rise in COVID-19 cases and deaths in India, which has been struggling to um, deal with the situation. And one of the challenges that they're facing, which the U.S. and other places faced, is that when people die, you have to dispose of the remains in some way. Um, and the bodies that um, have accumulated when it was happening in the U.S. were kept in freezer trucks because the capacity of morgues and uh, funeral homes was insufficient to, to process the number of people that were coming through. Um, India is a, a very different situation because uh, in um, the Hindu and Muslim uh, communities that are uh, so prominent in India, uh, cremation is is uh, for Hindus one of the primary means of disposing of bodies. And so there was this article that I saw in uh, Vox News uh, by uh, Kamiyani Sharma, uh, why the world must witness pictures of India's mass COVID-19 cremations. And the thing that I really was struck by in this piece was the framing of the article as uh, what role should we have in sharing images of the disposing of um, human remains. And so there has been a lot of coverage of this. Some of the coverage, the photographs have been done in an exoticizing way, in ways that um, present cremation to audiences um, that are news reading publics that are unfamiliar with this process. And one of the challenges of those pictures is that they run against um, potentially some of the uh, some of the people in in India who are have family members that may be involved with the disposal of these remains. Um, that this is a potentially an intimate ceremony that is being broadcast nationally. And so um, Time Magazine, for instance, had on its cover a picture of one of these cremation sites. And so there was generated from this quite a bit of outrage um, from um, Hindu communities about the, the sharing of this image that was capturing potentially a very sensitive moment. Um, this particular article by Sharma argues that um, there is no such um, uh, prohibition against sharing those images. And then, in fact, um, death and cremation and the process of the disposal of remains in India is a very public circumstance. And, and that's part of it. And I, I'm not an expert on Hinduism, but I, but I know that um, this has been a very common circumstance, the way in which images of the, of the departed and the way the, the disposal of human remains, that this has been a huge issue, issue in history courses where you might have um, the most famous example for me teaching American history is uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre, because there are several very famous images of um, uh, the frozen uh, corpses of people that died in, in that um, incident. And so we have kind of a longstanding tradition of, of being careful about showing images of um, deceased humans. And so this conversation, I thought, was, was a moment where um, religious studies sensibilities to try to understand how there could be these conflicting um, voices about it. Because Sharma's point uh, in the article is that to not display the pictures of the mass cremation of remains is one of the efforts to uh, uh, to make opaque the number of deaths that are actually occurring, and that by refusing to show images, um, we are actually reducing the, the availability of information about how serious the problem is in India right now. And with lots of reporting about under coverage of the number of deaths, that the number of deaths from COVID far at exceed the reported numbers. Uh, Sharma's point is that um, to, to raise those questions of um, the indecency or um, uh, the other kind of words that we might use to describe um, why we don't want those images there, that we have a kind of cross purposes there and that the, the conflict between those is going to be exceedingly hard to, to resolve. And I think religious studies focusing on the kind of language games and the moves rhetorically that people are using, that Sharma's point 
when we look at at that news piece is really making a case for the power of images, even ones that are unpalatable or perhaps um, provocative and deeply intimate, that, that maybe those images are really necessary in order to, to get to, to bigger issues. And I thought that that was a, a really powerful um, piece of journalism because it, it really put its finger on this problem of um, the fact that religious communities have very serious opinions about what happens to people when they die um, and that trying to treat those um, seriously and sensitively from an analytical perspective is not a small task. It's a very big task. And uh, yeah, so that's why I thought it was important to share that article today. It's interesting that you um, bring that up, Dave, with this idea of um, representation, I guess, of, of the dead. And in that sense, there's this question going on in that article, which thank you for sharing it. I found it really interesting. It was almost that question of, when does memorialization start? When does this process begin? You know, does that begin when that image is sent around on the interwebs with one particular sort of um, impetus behind it? Or is that something that started within the community? And it's an interesting question. And it's, it led on to another article that was actually sent to me um, by a colleague at the Sydney Jewish Museum, which is about this process of memorialization. Um, and it's about um, a synagogue slash memorial that's actually just been erected. It just, was just finished in this May 2021 in Babanya, which is actually in um, the Ukraine. And Babanya is actually a site of one of the most famous horrific massacres of the Holocaust, part of what's called the Holocaust by bullets in um on the 29th and 30th of September 1941, about 35,000 Jews were massacred um, in large pits into the ravines, really, actually, in Babanya. And over the next uh, couple of weeks and months, uh, an additional 100,000 Jewish people and POWs, people with disabilities, Sinti and Roma, were added into those ravines. And just in terms of religious studies, before we talk about the memorial that they've established, it's important for us to actually go back and look at the date that those massacres occurred on because the 30th of September, one of the main dates of the massacre in 1941, is Erev Yom Kippur. And that massacre is taking place on a very specific date for a very specific reason. Um, it's adding an element of trauma to that particular religious festival. Um, but what's interesting for us is that the Babanya Holocaust Memorial Foundation has actually built a synagogue um, at this particular site. Um, which is being used really as, as, a, as a park, a city park at the moment in the Ukraine. And this synagogue, I really would ev encourage everyone to have a look at it. It's by uh, Manuel, Her Manuel Hertz um, Architects. And they've designed this wooden synagogue with so much symbolism of connection between the past and the present. Even though it's a new memorial, it's being made of wood that is over 100 years old in order to connect the idea of the past and the present, but also it's the memorial is an, an active space, an active synagogue as the idea to bring the Jewish community back to this space where they've actually been forced out of in the past. Um, so it's interesting that we've had these two very different examples of this idea of religion and, and memorialization with, with COVID, but then with this memorial that's been built in the Ukraine as well. I was really captivated by the pictures in, in the architect's um, walkthrough of this that the synagogue was presented as a pop-up book and that mm. the design of all of the the pieces of of the architectural space though it will not fold up itself like a pop-up book were designed with the intentionality that that is the the origin of this and so then to make the textual physical in that way and to um scale up the reading of the Torah into the frame of the building itself, I thought was uh, deeply moving. Um, uh, they called it a, a cabinet of wonder. And I, and I thought that that was a, a perfect description of it. I also was taken aback by some of the decoration where they've actually kind of burnt into the wood, um, some imagery, particularly of, um, particular symbolism, but also of, of sort of, uh, silhouettes of, of, um, what looks like an Orthodox Jewish person and that idea of using um, fire and smoke 
in a very different way than it was used in the Holocaust is a very interesting symbolism there as well. Well, it's reminiscent of um, Hiroshima, uh, where you have yeah. the, there's, there's similar images burnt on by the explosion, which have become um, a sort of memorial in their own right. So it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting com- comparison. I, th- I thought the the emphasis on the chronology of of the events was was particularly captivating as well. They have a ceiling that has all of these um, uh, constellations and stars, so that when you look up at the at the ceiling that is painted with this mural, uh, that it's the night sky that would have been there on on the days of the massacre itself, and so. Yeah this spatial play and this chronological play um, that really emphasize a kind of um, a trans uh, location that would like every effort to bring you from the present back to those moments. Very and affecting. It's very affecting. You're right. And also it's one of those things where you realize the power of the information that has created the memorial right? Knowing the date and knowing the year has created the memorial. And as you say, those images that you referred to in your article from COVID, there's that question of information and what's that, how that is needed to honour those people that have been cremated in that way. And so I loved the article, how it really played with this idea of respect and disrespect and the idea of the present versus the future and the memory. It was a very interesting piece. To, to go to the cremation piece, though, um, I wonder to what degree there was an element of orientalization at play, not so much in the article, but in the reactions that the article's talking about, where there's definitely a reading of what's appropriate um, from a Western position, you know, we're, we're outraged on their behalf, but maybe they're not actually as bothered as we think they should be. It's a phenomenon I've seen a a fair few times. I mean, I I think to um, an article I taught once um, about, it was about a Tibetan Buddhist teacher in, I think it was in LA and he got embroiled like there was accusations of he was sleeping with one of his students and he was drinking a lot and things and everybody was like oh but you know it's um he's been corrupted by the west and it's this sort of corrupt version of buddhism (laughs) and the tibetans were going actually no this is fairly (laughs) typical in in tibet as well it's just uh, (laughs) but the uh, the the westerners were quite outraged that the west was corrupting this version of pure buddhism that they had and i wonder if this is a similar sort of situation we feel that religion is about this you know treating bodies in a certain way but uh, but we only really want to defend their right to, to do it in the same way. I think having having looked, I, I followed every link that was in the article, and several of them from India Facts were the most um, excoriating of Western journalism. It is is the sense of commodification that that they were particularly concerned about that these images did not have the approval of the people. Uh, who would have been involved in the proceedings. And so as, as public journalism goes, it, it seemed to violate some of the basic ethical tenets that you would get permission, that you would involve the families in those decisions. I think part of the challenge there with this, with these particular images is that the number of, of remains, the number of people that were involved in this is, so extraordinarily large that this this is that potentially means that no pictures could ever be shown because how could you ever contact so many people to get all of their approval for such images what's really striking about the the people that were arguing and this is um uh deepa uh, baksar and Salem in india facts um were the exoticization of the cremation was really the the instance where you know, this, the sense of, can you believe what they're doing over there, right? This is how bad that it is that can you believe that they're doing that way? And I, I think p- part of that really is a disconnect between the West and the way that we treat death here, um, which is that it's often a 
or increasingly a private affair that is not shared publicly that you don't see. And so, you know, open casket funerals that Catholics might have had, you know, uh, for a long time in the United States, um, are becoming increasingly less common. And so I think there, that there's that, that kind of East West dialogue where Western media simply has a different approach to to death and the display of um, processes associated with death that makes that especially uncomfortable because you're like, oh, look at what they're doing over there. We can show that because that's not us. They do it differently. So like, let's all point and look at that. It becomes a very kind of extremely awkward um, uh, intercultural dialogue there where I think both sides are um, in some sense speaking past one another about what the issues are. And then when you add the commodification on top of it, um, it, it makes it extremely fraught. Well, I do want to push back a little. I, I And I think you'll agree, Dave, because I definitely understand what you're saying about how Western media would approach death. And in this sense, sort of like the exoticizing how it's like, oh, wow, how is this happening? Um, look at that um, is, is certainly something to, to think about. But I would also say that the privatization of death rituals is more of a Protestant American thing, uh, given that many groups in the U.S. and North America, especially indigenous groups, have very different approaches to death. Um, but we're looking at where, where media might be talking about what's happening in India in a particular way. I, I'm reminded actually of uh, Native Hawaiian protests of the 30 meter telescope um, or the construction of the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea several years back now. Um, because the exoticization of native Hawaiian death rituals was not a point and look at that, or let's talk about that, but rather, um, a dismissal of it and, and, and sort of a veiling of it because the construction of this telescope, or they wanted to build it on Mauna Kea because of the particular views of the night sky that apparently are the best on that mountain. But Mauna Kea is a mountain whose Summit is a sacred site and burial ground for Native Hawaiians. And I think one way to really think about this is the way in which it's even discussed. If we look, or at least one aspect of approaching it is looking at the, the discourse around the events and how the, whether it's the media, the government, whoever, uh, the actors involved, are actually discussing what's going on because in a lot of what I saw in articles about the, the protests of the 30 meter telescope would always refer to the fact that Mauna Kea is considered to be a sacred spot by native Hawaiians or that some Hawaiians just dismiss native Hawaiians practices and rituals, beliefs, what have you, in favor of the construction of the telescope because it would help Hawaii's, you know, economic interests. And I was reminded when I was reading some of those things of Stephen Ramey's accidental favorites, because it's that, that subtle move that, that Mauna Kea is considered by native Hawaiians to be a sacred site, right? Not that it is, which already shows you the ways in which certain exoticized practices are delegitimized, are dismissed in favor of whatever sort of agenda is driving the issue. Even if it's an implicit move, those things are still happening. And, and to me, that's something that is really good to pay attention to because it gives us a way of talking about these events that isn't necessarily getting in, in the weeds of like, what one might find to be more ethically palatable, perhaps. And to sort of tie these together a little bit, I think the images from the concentration camps in 1945 communicated the reality of that situation um, in, in a much more effective way than anything else. I mean, horrifying though they are, 
you uh, you never forget that in a way that um you know just reading figures um doesn't achieve and it's interesting that you say that because in the article, and this is the last thing um, before we move on to the next story, but um, it was there was a very powerful phrase in the article that this is, I can't remember what it was, Dave, maybe you'll remember, it was a history of, of, of data or a story of data or something like that. It was all about facts and figures and numbers and these images humanised it in a way that not only is troubling in terms of what you were saying in terms of the way death is dealt with differently, but it puts a human face to the fact that, for example, in Australia, we're doing okay. And we actually closed our flights to Indian Australian nationals and we were the only ones we wouldn't let back home. And so those those images you're talking about, David, from the Holocaust are also about humanising the data as well, which I think is really important. Yeah. The phrase from the article is... Indians still do not know the full extent of the havoc wreaked by the virus because of what one expert calls a massacre of data, with hospitals, public officials, and even families believed to be undercounting and suppressing the number of cases and deaths. So I think the the analogies to the images of the Holocaust and, and concentration camps is really effective there in the sense that we are witnessing potentially the obscuring of, of, the, of the numbers on the ground and that the photographs do work, important work, to show that the facts on the ground are otherwise. And uh, we're going to stay with the theme of human remains for the next story, um, which is about um, the Move um, group. I'm going to I'm going to say group um, and uh, some uncomfortable things which have come to light recently. I'm going to give a little bit of background because this is a really little known story. Actually, I came across it maybe five years ago, um, speaking to Susan Palmer, a scholar of new religions and the law, and she told me about this, and I, and I did a double take, and I said, like, did you just say that they bombed them? And she said, yes, they bombed them in 1985, and this is in Philadelphia, and I went and read a little bit about it at the time, and um, but it's recently come to light, so a few people might have heard about them. Um, they were a black separatist religious group um they they certainly saw themselves as predominantly a religious group other people have described them as anarcho primitivists or um black uh, separatists um, they're all of those things um they were started by in philadelphia in 1972 by a guy called john africa which is a name so on the money for the leader of a group like that in philadelphia in 1972 um they they're often described as being similar to the black panthers but they've also got they've got a, a strongly sort of primitivist christian uh, but nature centric. So they, they, their religion is based on natural law, that all life comes from um, mother nature or mom nature, as they uh, say. Um, and, the, and as a result, all animals are of equal value. They sort of reject um, a lot of um, aspects of society. They promoted raw food. Um, um, and the, the right of, of all beings to sort of defend themselves and have freedom. Um, they, as a result of this, they, their children tended to wander around naked and they didn't have anything to do with local um, uh, munici municipal services. They just threw all of their garbage in the garden, in the yard, which uh, quickly attracted cockroaches and rats. They had um, they would adopt local stray animals, which then gathered into a pack, which roamed the neighborhood. And this is like a middle class black neighborhood, um, so they, they they started to get complaints to the police about them. They also had a tendency to to um, use a loud hailer at all hours of the day and night to preach their uh, message. So they basically the original complaints were not racially motivated. 
but the um the local mayor at the time is a notorious racist um i'm just trying to find his name now um and the they ended up having a, a shootout in 1978 between them and the police when they wouldn't give give them up. One policeman was shot, and ten was it no nine people were jailed from the movement for his death. So nine people were jailed for murder. Three, um, and those people, two of them died in jail, and the the others were released between. Uh, 2018 and 2020 the last one was just released um just a little over a year ago they're all in their 60s now um the the house they were living in was destroyed in this you know it was not completely destroyed not not in the way that it will be later but they moved to another uh, another um house in a in a different region of philadelphia um which the same same situations began um, sort of escalated, um, ending in a, an armed siege um, in May the May the thirteenth, nineteen eighty five. So, um, you know, what's that? Uh, Forty six years ago, is my maths correct? No, thirty six years ago. Um, which ended with them dropping two one-pound bombs on the top of this um, uh, uh, this this house, which hit some fuel and blew up and destroyed the entire house. It was allowed to burn to the ground. Um, the according to the local police, this was because the they were concerned the firefighters would get shot at according to many many others this was because um the firefighters were told to let it burn to the ground by the police um the the house the remains of the house were flattened the day after like even though it was an active crime scene the police flattened it the day after and uh, so it the the um everybody or I th- no eleven people in the house which I think was almost everybody um six adults and five children um all died and the fire spread and destroyed sixty five other houses in the area um the so um although this wasn't the FBI it was the police the FBI supplied some of the explosives now this in, in contextually you've got to think about this as being somewhere between Jonestown but before you know between Jonestown and Waco so it's after Jonestown people are concerned about what's happening in these in these cults um and I'm doing quote marks in my head when I say that of course and um but they haven't got to the point where there's where the FBI have been shown to be you know that using strong arm tactics with them is it causes more harm than it solves right so we're somewhere in the middle of all that um yet it's exactly the same story that it's people who are annoying but there's no really good claims of of, you know of of abuse or anything there isn't a lot of strong reasons to to have an armed siege and bomb people and it's in the name of saving children that they go in and of course as with uh, Waco um children are killed in in this uh you know action which is claimed to be for their benefit um okay so jumping forward why has this come back to light well uh the first thing that happened was that uh, they started to get released and uh this put some press attention back onto this this story um, after a long, long time. And then there was a statement um, which came out um, saying that they were going to have a national, uh, well, not national, if Philadelphia was going to have an annual day of remembrance for this on May the 13th. Um, and a lot of people were thought, oh, this is very odd. A few days later, the story broke that um, the University of Pennsylvania 
in collaboration with the Penn Museum, had actually been storing the bones of some of the victims since uh, the time of the bombing in 1985. Um, they apologized specifically for having them. It turns out that it was the bones of two of the children who were killed in the bombing were being stored by the museum and the university and in fact appeared in a uh, a video asset for an anthropology course at the University of Pennsylvania, um, where uh, you know a teaching um, a lecturer shows uh, shows the bones as an example of the kind of anthropological material. Now, and it, there is some there is some corruption. Um, it looks like the 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 actual lecturer um let me get the person's name um alan mann who is a professor at penn and uh janet i think it's pronounced mong m-o-n-g-e who is the keeper the curator of the penn museum seem to have kept um the bones without being given permission to do so um and Nonetheless, this is, I, I can remember even 20 years ago when there was a lot of concern about, for instance, having um, the human remains belonging to African tribes that people had taken back during the sort of height of colonialism on display in museums. Um, you know, and the argument was being this showed how, you know, we did we treated them as less human. We wouldn't we wouldn't take somebody from the West and put their child's bones on display in a museum. And that's exactly what we were doing. And yet, and yet, it turns out that even in twenty twenty one, we were doing specifically that. And again, you know, if you want to make any connections with how um, certain institutions um, view. Uh, members of the black community, especially if they're um, involved with weird religions or if they criticize capitalism, um, whether they view them as fully human or not either. But um, yeah, so I, th I thought that was an interesting story, not only because of the human remains aspect, which seems to be the theme of today, but also, uh, you know, a little bit of reflection on what it is we do when we, we do um, anthropological work. Um, any Any thoughts about this, guys? As an Americanist, this is a lot more common than we'd like to admit that it is. The handling of Native American remains, for instance, has been a huge issue at museums across the US. For this particular one, I think it, it evokes a lot of the conversations about um, uh, strange fruit is the term that is often used. And so in the, the article that you cite from the Philadelphia Inquirer, the, the article by um, Abdul Ali Muhammad uh, says at the end, black people, our bodies and our remains are not academic strange fruit. We are not playthings nor instruction devices for anthropologists and our sacred vessels deserve to rest in peace and be respected. I think that's a sentiment that a lot of Native American groups have made and a lot of um, African Americans have made towards museums that hold relics uh, of Native American and indigenous and um, enslaved persons, that there is a long history of anthropology and museum studies and curatorial kind of services, not recognizing the dignity of the human remains that they are encountered and f failing to address those uh, in ways. The most striking point of what you said, David, was that, you know, these were items that, that were, I, I don't know that actively is the right word, but, but were being used as instructional aids is deeply, deeply troubling. Um, and the, 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 it, the, uh, the other members of MOVE had no idea about this um, until it came out in the news in, in 2021. Yeah, and strange fruit as well, Dave. I mean, the, the the choice of words there is very striking. It's clearly a reference to the lynchings. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, 
quite astonishing. We've we yeah we're at we're forty odd minutes already. Um, I I think maybe maybe we we can't follow that really, can we? Um, we can just uh, wrap up at this point. Um, sometimes these are uh, um, sometimes these are more fun than this one, um, but you know, uh, important stuff happening and uh, incredible actually how many similarities there were between these three stories. Um, so hopefully uh, we've uh, given the listeners some things to think about and uh, some things to do in terms of supporting Sydney specifically, but also any other department of religious studies. Um, the importance of the study of religion and of the humanities and social sciences more broadly has never been clearer. Um, so let's just bear that in mind. Great. And uh, thanks for joining me early in the morning, late at night, uh, wherever you are. Um, I'm David Robertson. Thanks Thanks for listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Brianne Fallon and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter, that's me, and David Robertson, that's the other guy. Our features are edited by Rebecca Barrett-Fox and Lauren Osborne and our opportunities digest by Ella Buck. Audio editing by Alex Matthews, podcast transcription by Andy Alexander and Savannah Finver and social media managed by Ray Radford and Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon affiliate links or donating at patreon.com backslash project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes and other portals. Thanks for listening.